Are you fucking kidding me? No, this has got to be a joke, right? I don't deserve this. I don't deserve all this. Um, no, on a serious note here, uh, I want to thank everybody who donated uh, to the GoFundMe for the Secular Talk Studio. I'm fucking floored by how awesome it is. Uh, for those of you who didn't see the segment I did last night, check that out. I gave you kind of a little behind-the-scenes tour of this new studio that I'm sitting in. Uh, I can't tell you how much I love it. Uh, we tried to stay true to uh, the Secular Talk originality. So, you know, the LED lights, which featured in, you know, the old studio, at least for a, a brief period of time. We still got the audio foam, which um, I had trouble letting go of, man. I can't let go of that audio foam. And um, obviously incorporated some new stuff. We got the white brick. We got the monitors. Got multiple monitors. You don't see uh, another one is not on camera here because it's just me right now. There's enough room now for four people in the studio as opposed to the old studio where it was just enough room for one person. So uh, I'm, I'm absolutely humbled by how this went down and, and the outpouring of support that you guys gave. And uh, I want to continue to do my best here and be as objective as possible and be as factual as possible in giving you guys the news. And hopefully you love the new studio. I know I do. So without further ado, here we go with the first show in the new studio. So a uh, lot to get to today. I want to give you guys a little breakdown real quick of what you have to look forward to. We have um, a lot on Donald Trump today. You won't be surprised to learn. So um, there's a big story that's getting no attention, but it should be getting a lot of attention. It's, of course, Donald Trump and the fact that he committed fraud and now he's president of the United States. We're going to get to that right off the bat here. We have uh, Trump's pick for attorney general, Jeff Sessions. I got to give you some facts on that guy. And oh my goodness, he basically couldn't have gone with a worse person than Jeff Sessions. So all the talk of uh, draining the swamp and changing Washington and being anti-establishment and being an outsider, pretty much bullshit. And Jeff Sessions is the perfect evidence of that. Uh, we also have everything that Trump promised to do on day one. Spoiler, he's not even going to get to like 10% of it. Uh, and then later on in the show, uh, if we have time, I wanted to get to, where is that story? No, not that one. Oh, John Bolton again. Uh, Mr. Uh, I keep saying this about him because it's kind of true. He makes Dick Cheney look like Noam Chomsky. The guy never met a war he doesn't love. And he keeps talking. And Trump wants him for Secretary of State. Or at least he's one of the people being floated that Trump wants for Secretary of State. All right, so uh, let's get started. So, uh, here's a big story that isn't getting the attention it deserves. Law News reports here. President-elect Donald Trump settled three contentious fraud lawsuits for $25 million. Of course, he went on Twitter to make a statement about this because he's a grown-ass man who makes statements about this stuff on Twitter. He said, I settled the Trump University lawsuit for a small fraction of the potential award because as president, I have to focus on our country. The only bad thing about winning the presidency is that I did not have the time to go through a long but winning trial on Trump University. Too bad! That's such a Trump tweet. So uh, this is obviously hilarious for multiple reasons. He said repeatedly during the primary and at other times, I never settle. I never, I never settle lawsuits because I always win lawsuits because I'm tremendous. Believe me, I'm always right. Let me just tell you. Uh, well, it turns out, no, he does settle. And I like just the lie that's coming out of this too. <laughs> I never settle, but then you just settled. But then there's also like 913 cases beforehand that you settled, even though you say you didn't settle and you don't settle. And um, here's what you don't do if you actually didn't do it. Settle. <laughs> like, I know he's saying, no, 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 it's because I'm president and all this. It, dude, he's got, what is it, over 4,000? He's been involved in over 4,000 lawsuits. There was that report from the Washington Post. Um, and even right now, he has multiple lawsuits going on. So, weird. Some of them you didn't settle. This one you are settling. 
It's almost like in some of the other cases, you actually have an argument. And in this case, you don't have an argument. So you said, all right, what can I do to make this go away? Let's sit down and have a conversation. And the, the result of that conversation was, look, best thing to do is just settle. I mean, this is what his lawyers probably told him. Like, dude, look, if you, if you take this any further, it's going to go to court. And then all the facts are going to come out about what you actually did. You, there's a good chance you're going to lose. So just settle it now. So I need you to stop and think about this. The person who was just elected president of the United States of America uh, is basically admitting here, yeah, I did fraud. People don't know all the details of what happened with Trump University, but it was fucking amazing. I mean, it's mind-blowing how brazen of a scam it was. I mean, you're talking about a person who, first of all, he promised to be there at all the different courses. He wasn't. In fact, at the end of some of the courses, they had the students take uh, pictures with cardboard cutouts of Trump. <laughs> I mean, how ridiculous is that? He also hired people who had already gone to prison because they were con artists. So he hired known con artists to do this. And it was the classic techniques. One of them is called upselling. So you, you know, uh, have these people pay money to come see you and to come to your goofy ass course. And then during, uh, during the course, they say, oh, look, here's the thing. I know we said we were going to give you all of the, you know, important Trump secrets. But what you really have to do is buy the next level package up. And then if you do that, you'll be able to get the real Trump secrets. So they bang him out up front for however much it was, and then they try to get him for thousands more. And a lot of reports said they actually specifically uh, focused on, like, the elderly, for example, people who they thought were suckers. So this is the next president of the United States of America. Now, again, this is not to say, and I need everybody to understand this, this is not to say that, oh, Hillary was blameless and it would have been wonderful if she was in there. Of course not. Fuck Hillary Clinton, too. But there is something to be said about the fact that this guy just paid $25 million to settle a fraud lawsuit. Could you imagine for just a split second, Obama in 2008 had to settle a fraud lawsuit. He had to pay out millions of dollars because he had a shady past with shady scam businesses. First of all, the right would never let that go and they would have tanked him on that alone. But the Democrats are weak ass bitches so they don't even know how to make a coherent argument against Trump when it's clear he committed fraud. How bad of a party are the Democrats that they can't pounce on this? And this guy beat the Democratic candidate. I mean, they just, they handed the Democrats a gift. All you needed was a, a, a semi-competent campaign strategist and Hillary Clinton would have beaten Donald Trump easy. But no, and I mean, look, even if you had Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump, he didn't even need to run a good campaign. He would have won anyway. So what a sad state of affairs, man. I mean, the next president of the United States of America committed fraud. Wonderful. That's the first story we've ever done in our new studio. The memories, the memories that are being created. It's amazing. Okay, um, the second story is also on Donald Trump. <laughs> oh, it's going to be four years at least. Oh, make it stop. Make it stop. Okay, so here we go. Uh, Donald Trump has a pick for attorney general, and it's Jeff Sessions. He's a senator from Alabama, and here are some facts about him. Quote, he defended Trump's proposed ban on Muslims from entering the United States. Stay classy, basically admitting, yeah, yeah, I'm a bigot. I want to ban 1.6 billion people because, you know, Al-Qaeda exists, ISIS exists, and if they're Muslim, they're close enough. Moderates are not a thing, reformists are not a thing, Sufi Muslims are not a thing, Ahmadi Muslims are not a thing, ban all of them. So, right off the bat, really great guy here. Uh, more, in 1986, a bipartisan majority of the Senate Judiciary Committee rejected his nomination to a federal judgeship in the midst of charges of racial bias. For example, Sessions had criticized civil rights groups as un-American and communist-inspired and accused them of trying to force civil rights down the throats of people. Oh, that's so stupid. So, uh, it's not, you know, forcing your will down people's throats to reject civil rights. 
like to keep blacks as second class citizens. That's not forcing your will on black people, no. But when they ask for civil rights, well, I mean, look, you're forcing your will on me. Guys, do you understand how ridiculous this is? In 1986, Republicans rejected Jeff Sessions because they went, That guy appears to be a wee bit too racist. We've entered the twilight zone. Again, to steal from Bill Maher, the zombies have taken over the mall. When the Republicans of 1986 say, oh, you're too racist. I I'm speechless. I mean, th we're talking about the era where Ronald Reagan made up the myths of the, the black welfare queen. Who, she makes over $100,000 a year. Nonsense. That's all made. Of course you can't make over $100,000 a year on government programs. How stupid do people have to be to believe that? In the era Reagan was making that shit up, a little after it, to be fair. Uh, they're like, yeah, Jeff Sessions, too racist. Now, I'm going to give you more evidence to that effect. He also dubbed a white civil rights attorney a, quote, disgrace to his race and reportedly called a black lawyer in his office, boy. Oh. In his confirmation hearing, he admitted to referring to the Voting Rights Act as a piece of intrusive legislation, and he later opposed efforts to update the landmark law. As the New Republic chronicled, Sessions prosecuted civil rights activists for trying to register black voters while saying that he only disapproved of the KKK after he, quote, found out that some of them were pot smokers, a remark he later insisted was a joke. And then here's my favorite gem of a quote from him. He said, good people don't smoke marijuana. This is a guy who's stuck in the year like... 1906, and he might be our attorney general. So this is going to be the guy who's responsible for uh, federal hate crimes. If there's an, a, you know, a hate crime that happens and on a federal level, they got to look into it. This guy's going to going to do the right thing. This guy's going to look out for the rights of all people. I okay, I just told you he he criticized a white civil rights lawyer as a traitor to his race. And understand, I really cannot overstate how bad this is in every way. Because this is a guy who, okay, I, I keep explaining to people and they don't get it. Well, some of you guys get it, of course. I love you. I'm not, I'm not trying to be angry at you. You have a system in the U.S. where federal law overrides state law. So all of the progress made on the issue of marijuana, for example, could just go away with the wrong administration. So you have the attorney general who's massively anti-marijuana and just anti-drug, period. He has the authority and the ability, if the president gives him the green light, yeah, Jeff, go run roughshod over legal marijuana in Colorado and Washington State. Forget about it. You can do a crackdown on the medical marijuana industry. You know, California just, legal, uh, just uh, legalized recreational marijuana too. To crack down. I don't care because you're allowed to do it. Even though it's legal in the states, it's illegal at a federal level. Still a Schedule One drug. Go ahead. You have the green light. Crack down on them. So all this progress that we made, gone. So understand, this is why, like, yes, it's absolutely true that the establishment Democrats, they're neoliberal sellouts to Wall Street and they're horrendous and Hillary Clinton had a million and one scandals, a lot of them legitimate scandals. But it's still not the case that they are equally bad because you're not going to get, you see it from Obama right now, Obama's taken, at least in the second term to be clear, he's taken a more hands-off approach. He's freed uh, many nonviolent drug offenders. I mean, he deserves a hell of a lot of credit for that. He's actually, he just broke the record recently for commutations and pardons because he's like getting rid of, letting go of all these nonviolent drug offenders. So it's not equal. Jeff Sessions is literally one of the most conservative senators in the United States of America. To have this guy in any position of authority is a nightmare. So all the talk about draining the swamp and, you know, doing the right thing for the American people. Mm, my ass cheeks, son. My ass cheeks. Doesn't look like that right now. Donald Trump is going in the wrong directions direction with many of his appointments. Okay. Wait for it. Would you like to take a guess who the third story is about? D. Treasy. Okay. <laughs> Everybody who saw the 
the unveiling of the studio yesterday, the behind the scenes look, they know that right now I'm sitting on roughly 312 cushions. <laughs> We got the smallest chairs ever by accident. And I love how, by the way, there were some comments on the video like, you know they're adjustable, right? Yeah. <laughs> you think I didn't try that? How stupid would I have to be? Oh man, I got these chairs and they don't, they don't do anything. Even at the highest setting, you can only see from like nipples and up. It is ridiculous. So yeah, I tried to adjust the, the height of the chairs. But anyway, so I got like a mountain of fucking cushions I'm sitting on right now. Massively uncomfortable. I'm waiting to get uh, some new chairs because these are just not going to cut it. But anyway, I digress. Now we go to Donald Trump's pick to lead the CIA, and it's just as bad. Uh, so let's talk about Donald Trump's pick to lead the CIA. Uh, it's basically as bad as it gets. He picked Kansas Congressman Mike Pompeo. So uh, what's this guy known for? Well, sit down, buckle up. Here we go. He advocates for torture. With so many of Trump's picks, it's strike one, you're out. <laughs> Ain't no two and three, bitch. Strike one, you're out. You're gonna have somebody lead the CIA who's like, Torture! <laughs> I'm with it. Yeah, that's a great way to show uh, to the rest of the world that we really are the world policeman who ca cares about humanitarianism and altruism. Yeah, good argument. Oh, but when we torture, it's cool. When you torture your rogue state, your terrorist nation, you need regime change. Do we need regime change? When this guy says, hey, look, man, I'm the head of the CIA and I, uh, and I'm, I approve of torture. Should other nations, should Iran be having a conversation? You know, I think the U.S. is ripe for regime change. I love the double standards and the hypocrisy. And by love, I mean despise. Anyway, uh, he wants expanded NSA spying. I wasn't even sure that was possible. <laughs> like, it's already as bad as it gets. They're like, take it further. Just a little bit further. Just a little bit further. Uh, he's a staunch defender of Guantanamo Bay. He's called it a, quote, important national asset. Uh, and here's my favorite fact about him. McClatchy explains here. A spokesman for Coke Industries applauded U.S. Representative Mike Pompeo's selection to serve as CIA Director Friday. The Wichita-based company has been the Republican congressman's biggest political contributor since he first ran for the U.S. House in 2010. Members of the Koch family, their employees, and affiliated groups have donated a combined $357,300 to Pompeo's campaigns and political action committee, according to the Center for Responsive Politics. <sighs> Good googly moogly. Good googly moogly. That means that this guy, I mean, look, we already have the, the melding together, the meshing together of corporation and state in the United States. Now we have somebody who's, who could potentially be the head of the CIA, Trump wants for the head of the CIA, who's a bitch to the oil and gas industry. I mean, back in the day, we toppled foreign governments for bananas. I'm not kidding. I mean, read about the banana wars. Insanity. So uh, you don't think we would g get more involved in the Middle East, get more involved in foreign conflicts to, for the oil industry? Oh, you know we would. Look at the war in Iraq, bitch. That was at least partly the reason. Not the whole reason, but partly the reason. Well, now you got the head of the CIA, Donald Trump. Wants, he's a little bitch to the Koch brothers. And by the way, uh, how do you think that bodes for people, for example, posting, uh, protesting the Dakota Access Pipeline right now? You have a bitch to the oil industry running the CIA. The transition to police state may be complete. This is as devastating as it gets, man. Mike Pompeo. And, guys, he called for Edward Snowden to be executed. So, you know, you guys probably thought, just like I thought, to be, to be fair, during the, uh, not the primary season, but the general election, with WikiLeaks, you know, dumping a lot of information on Hillary Clinton... You probably thought, well, look, I mean, maybe a weird, unexpected upside if Trump gets in there is that maybe he pardons Assange? Maybe he pardons Snowden? No. He's looking at the guy who he wants to lead the CIA wants Snowden executed. <sighs> I mean, look, again, the Democrats are bad. You got President Obama... Basically, he's like, he should come back and stand trial. That's what President Obama says. 
That's bad enough. He shouldn't. He's a fucking national hero. We don't need a trial. He released information uh, about how the government took away your Fourth Amendment rights. He's a hero. The government is the criminal. So Obama's bad enough with the come back and face trial, which, by the way, is a trick because he's not even allowed to use the defense of public good because of some old obscure law. He's not allowed to say, oh, I was looking out for the public good. Interesting. Hillary Clinton is allowed to say, oh, my intent was pure, so it's okay. Edward Snowden cannot say my intent was pure, so it's okay. So Obama's bad enough. But now you got this guy, who might be the head of the CIA. I want him executed. If he dies in suspicious circumstances, it ain't because he choked on a mozzarella stick. That's all I'll say. Oh, motherfucker. I don't have... I'm not gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. I don't have a drink near me. Huh? You know what drink I'm talking about? We sold out. Big seltzer. Holla at your boy. I'm going to give you guys the dirty details on this, man. I mean, you guys, I did the segment you guys saw. You know that the the guy from the company, he reached asked me, he's like, we're going to give you a shirt. I was like, that's awesome. He's like, I can hook you up with some discontinued flavors too. I was like, my life is made. He's like, we got pineapple in this bitch. We got blueberry. I was like, yo, 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 let me get that blueberry, son. Let me get that blueberry on the low. <laughs> Sold out. Sold out to Big Seltzer. You'll never see a, you'll never see a story on this show criticizing Seltzer. <laughs> I told you, they could have salmonella outbreak. I'll be like, I don't know what you guys are talking about, man. Stuff is delicious. Salmonella flavor is my favorite. Okay, uh, next story. Uh, you want to take a guess who it's about? Oh, just... oh no, President Fuckface. President-elect Trump went on a tweet storm yesterday yet again. Uh, he said, I watched parts of Saturday Night Live last night. It is a totally one-sided, biased show. Nothing funny at all. Equal time for us? Okay, what? <laughs> I don't even know what all that means. So first of all, you understand it's a comedy show. You understand it's satire. So like you're getting all butt hurt over it. Pipe down. Now, he doesn't get that. The guy fucking sued Bill Maher over a joke, and he sued The Onion over a satire article. So you want to talk about thin-skinned. He, he has legendary, infamous thin skin. But then the equal time for us, like, okay, conservatives, weren't you the ones who used to criticize the Fairness Doctrine? Uh, now, all of a sudden, Trump is basically called a fairness doctrine. Should we have should we have equal time for, like, a conservative version of SNL? Should we do that? What happened? I thought you guys, free marketplace of ideas. And in the free marketplace of ideas, it turns out there's many more shows that are comedy that are left-leaning. Uh, no, we must have conservative ones. One-sided, biased. Why don't you critique the other Democratic president? Uh, okay, they have gone after Democratic presidents. But furthermore, you just got elected president. Like, what do you want them to do? Like, eh, hands off. Like, dude, you're going to get fucking made fun of. You're the most powerful person on earth. You're soon to be the most powerful person on earth. People are going to make fun of you. And they should. They should. They should. It's not even close. Okay. Uh, so he said that. He also said, The cast and producers of Hamilton, the play, which I hear is highly overrated, should immediately apologize to Mike Pence for their terrible behavior. So uh, what he's referring to there is Mike Pence got booed at um, a showing of Hamilton. And then I think the cast came out at the end and they like gave a speech. I didn't even watch it to be honest, but they said they were critical of him. They're like uphold American values, yada, yada, yada. Uh, so that's what we call dissent in what we call a free country. You might want to look into that, Donald Trump, since you're about to fucking lead that country. But no, again, so he's, he's tweeting about Saturday Night Live and Hamilton. Meanwhile, what's going on? Well, uh, let's take a look at... Uh, the Daily Beast here, they say the following, quote, The Southern Poverty Law Center has collected incidents of hateful harassment since the election, and the, and the tally is now up to 701. Around 65% of the incidents collected occurred in the first three days following the election. The most common type of incident was categorized as anti-immigrant. So, uh, let me explain what this means in simpler terms. There's just been, there's been hundreds, hundreds of examples of uh, people, you know, spray painting Trump on like minority houses or a black church 
or screaming Trump as they berate minorities and say, we're in control now. Usually some douchey, like, old white dude. It's our country now. Better know your role and know your place. Trump, Trump, Trump. So that's happening. And again, it's not like a, f a couple of incidents. It's not like, well, look, there were 10, but it was dispersed all around the country. So what are you going to do? I'm sure it happens after any election. 701 incidents. 701. The KKK did a rally in North Carolina to celebrate Trump's victory. Hey, Don, got any thoughts on that? Got any tweets for me? I'm just curious if you, if you know, maybe you think that's a fucking horrendous thing and maybe you uh, want to tell the KKK, hey, I'm not with you. You shouldn't be celebrating me. I'm coming after you. Now, look, to be fair to Trump, the day after the election or a few days after the election, uh, he was asked about this in 60 Minutes and he said, okay, look, to the people doing, you know, uh, attacks and they think it's in my name, stop. So he was unequivocal and I give him credit for that. But the fact that today, and in the past few days, you're tweeting about SNL in this outraged way, and you're tweeting about Hamilton, but you got nothing to say about the over, over 700, 701 harassment incidents in your name since election day, well, that tells me your priorities, and that tells me the way you think, and the way he thinks is very simple. If you're on Team Trump, you're okay. You're with me, you're okay. You're against me, you're bad. I mean, that's what it is. How many times has Donald Trump liked somebody because they said a few kind words about him? And then if they ever say anything critical about him, he lashes out. Overrated. Sad. Pathetic. Because he's a man-child. You say something good about me? Okay, now you're my buddy. You say something bad about me? Oh, now I'm against you. So, you know, that takes... So it takes precedent to attack SNL and Hamilton over fucking harassment done in his name. Well, to steal a phrase here, ironically, sad. Goofball. All right, look. I got one more here on Donald Trump, and then we're going to move on, finally. Um, just making sure that he doesn't randomly pop up later in the show. Yeah, he does. <laughs> sad. Double sad. Okay. Donald Trump's day one agenda. Buckle up. So Donald Trump has made... Um, Roughly 13,316 statements uh, about what he plans to do on day one of his administration. Now, it's not just Donald Trump. This is something all politicians do, or a lot of politicians do. Like, on day one, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. And then eventually, it just becomes a list that's impossible. It's hard to get fucking anything done. But <laughs> let me go ahead and give you what he said, because it's pretty funny. So he says, uh, on day one, I want to enforce United States law. I like how vague and broad that is. Like, I, what? What does that even mean? He says, begin work on a border wall. You're just going to begin work on it? Pretty sure that needs congressional approval. No, no, I'm just going to do it. Okay, more. Pursue a constitutional amendment to put term limits on Congress. Okay, now that's interesting. You're certainly not going to be able to do that on day one. But that's an interesting thought. You know, I, I'm open on term limits. Um, I have, like, mixed feelings on it. I don't think it does what the intended goal is, which people say is, oh, I want to limit corruption. Well, that doesn't really happen because you could just be in there for a short amount of time and be corrupt. So that has more to do with the funding of the politicians. Um, but, yeah, I kind of like the idea that the president has term limits. I do think there's something good about that. I don't know how I feel about that with Congress and with, uh, I mean, because Bernie Sanders, for example, he's been a senator since 1836. Him and Van Buren were elected the same year. <laughs> well, I don't have no idea Van Buren was elected in 1836. But he's been in there forever, and he's been good all, all along. So, you know, there's an argument for him, there's an ar argument against him. But he's not going to get him done on day one. All right, um, more. He says, institute a hiring freeze for most federal workers. Eliminate two regulations for every one passed. I don't even get... Okay, but that's just so made up. Like, in theory, that sounds good to people on the right, but, like, when you actually have to implement it, it's just ridiculous. So, I mean, for example, he wants to eliminate the FDA and the EPA. Well, then, uh, I hope you're ready for many foodborne illnesses to break out across the country. Like, they say these things like there's no consequences, there's no downsides. There's massive downsides! What, are you crazy? Of course there are! Okay, more. Five-year ban on White House and congressional officials becoming lobbyists. I'd make that a lifetime ban. Impose lifetime ban on White House officials lobbying for foreign governments. Hmm, interesting. 
um, which is not a bad idea, but it's a little weird because, um, you know, Paul Manafort, his former campaign manager, had ties to Ukraine, had ties to, ties to Russia. I'm not saying, by the way, the ones about Trump seem like speculation to me more than have been proven. Paul Manafort has been proven. He does have ties to Russia. He does have ties to Ukraine. And, uh, I mean, he wrote that specifically for against Hillary Clinton because Hillary, with her connections to Qatar and Saudi Arabia, which I massively disagree with, too. But Trump himself has connections. He was just at a business meeting with uh, it, people in India who are property owners, business businessmen from India, big-time businessmen. But now he's saying, like, okay, impose a lifetime ban on White House officials lobbying for foreign governments. It's just, it's weird that, I mean, obviously there's double standards. We're talking about Donald Trump here. Uh, he says... Withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Hey, man, you got to partner on that one if you stick to it. But I fear he might do the same trick that Hillary Clinton was going to do, which is, hmm, you know, I'm against it, but we tweaked a few provisions. And now it's no longer the TPP. Now it's the Trump trade deal, TTD, and it's going to be tremendous, believe me. Uh, so let's pass it. I think that's still a possibility. Uh, label China a currency manipulator. Oh, boy. Don't spark a trade war. They were warning about that the other day. Begin work to end foreign trading abuses. Lift roadblocks on the Keystone Pipeline. Here we go. By the way, what do you think is going to happen with the Dakota Access Pipeline? If Obama himself doesn't say, okay, green light, go ahead, fuck the protesters, um, Donald Trump will definitely, I mean, he'd probably crack down on them ruthlessly. Um, he says, cancel payments to UN climate change program. Oh, boy. This is the one, I don't think people get how much of a disaster Trump is likely to be on climate change. I mean, he thinks it's a Chinese hoax. He said that on Twitter. <laughs> he, he said he wants to pull out of the Paris Agreement on day one. It looks like he's going to keep that promise. And it, we get stuff like this. And it's casual to him. It's like, yeah, just stop worrying about climate change. Well, there are downsides to that, buddy. Uh, I mean, we're already past the tipping point, according to some scientists. I mean, we got to act now. This is, in, I mean, sea level rise is inevitable, but... I mean, even natural disasters that get even worse are coming. They're already increasing. We've had the last decade was like the hottest on record. The time to panic is now. Climate change is not, oh, it's just happening somewhere off in the future. No, it's happening right now. Wait until you get famine and drought and wars over water. I mean, again, people don't really get how disastrous this is. Um, and then he also says, but by the way, this is all first day, so... He's not, not even going to be able to do 10% of this. Uh, he says, repeal Obamacare. End the war on coal. Begin, begin renegotiating uh, NAFTA. Remove criminal illegal aliens. Cancel unconstitutional executive actions. Which, by the way, means all executive orders that Obama did. They're just going to cancel all of them. Mitch McConnell already told them, I want you to cancel all of them. And there's a lot of good ones Obama did. So, for example the increase uh, for overtime payment. Obama expanded uh, people who get uh, overtime pay by law. Trump and McConnell were like, Pfft. yeah, I'm for the working man. Anyway, scrap that one. Uh, and he says, begin filling the Supreme Court vacancy, <laughs> uh, cancel federal funding to sanctuary cities, suspend immigration from terror-prone places. So again, he would just say, all oh, the Muslim countries, whatever, ban them all. Anyway. This is all what he said on day one. Okay, guys, like, can we... Can we be just a little bit reasonable here <laughs> and understand that this makes him a fucking gigantic liar? Like, dude, you're just a liar. If you said all that, you're just a liar. You're over-promising, you're gonna under-deliver, and a lot of the promises are disastrous anyway. Um, He's so full of shit, and he somehow gets away with it seemingly more than any other politician. I mean, he won the fucking election. Not saying Hillary Clinton wasn't a bullshitter. She certainly was. But I mean, this guy, good googly moogly. All of that on day one? My ass cheeks on day one. Okay. Now we go to a story about Obama. So we're off of Trump. But not really, because this includes Trump. Ugh. All Trump, Trumpular talk. That's what we're going to call the show from now on. President Obama offered up some thoughts on how the House and Senate Dems should deal with a Trump presidency. He said, quote, give Trump a hearing. I certainly don't want them to do what Mitch McConnell did when I was elected. 
meet the day of and say, our sole objective is to not cooperate with him on anything, even if the country is about to go into a depression so that we can gain seats in the midterms and defeat him. My advice to Democrats is know what you care about and what you stand for and fight for your principles, even if it's a hard fight. Okay, uh, so what's my take on this? Well, on the one hand, that's the exact right thing to do. It's the adult thing to do. And it's exactly what Bernie Sanders and, and Elizabeth Warren promised to do because they came out and said, okay, if he wants to make a deal on infrastructure, Mr. President, let's do it. If he wants to block TPP, Mr. President, let's do it. If he wants to protect Social Security and Medicare like he said he wants to do, if he wants to help the unions out, if he actually wants to look out for the working man like some of his campaign re rhetoric indicated. Mr. President, we're on your team 100%. So they said that, but then they also said, we ain't going to budge an inch on, oh, you want to ban all Muslims? Please. We're going to block you and you're done. Hell no. You're not going to ban all Muslims. No, you're not going to deport all undocumented immigrants. No, you're not going to implement policies that are anti-woman and takes away reproductive rights and yada, 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 yada. So they said, okay, we'll oppose him vigorously when we disagree with him. When we agree with him, we'll work with him. So if, if Obama's talking about that kind of adult governance, I agree with him 100%. Because that's just, that's common sense. But here's what I fear. I fear that Obama's saying this, it's basically a hint, it's a sign that you're going to have the establishment Democrats will take this as a green light, like all the green lights behind me, uh, witty, um, to compromise on shitty Wall Street giveaways and just being quintessential establishment insider pricks. Because whenever the Democrats and the Republicans agree on something, it's not because it's actually Democratic goals that they both want to implement. Whenever the Democrats and the Republicans agree, it's the Democrats caving to agree with the Republicans on some shit. So I fear that they'll use this as like, you know, oh, we can approve, we can do the repatriation deal, for example. So take the, the billions of dollars that are overseas that corporations are stashing there and dodging their taxes, bring them back here. And we'll give them a, a break, give them a much lower tax rate than what they're supposed to pay and what you would pay if you were hiding your money overseas. So they might agree on that. They might agree on, you know, more Wall Street bailouts or more corporate subsidies or whatever it is. That's what I fear is actually going to happen with what Obama's talking about here. And they could just cave to right-wing priorities. So we're going to have to wait and see. You know, maybe that's not the case. Maybe I'm being too cynical here. But it is striking that with the Republicans, you get this sense of hell no when a Democratic president is elected. But when a Republican president is elected, the Democrats go, maybe... So that could be a good thing, that could be a bad thing, depending on exactly what they mean and what issues they agree on, but we'll reserve judgment and wait and see. Okay. These lights are fucking hot, man. <laughs> These studio lights? Goodness gracious. Let me adjust myself on the cushions. Tremendous. Smooth. That's my O face. Oh, oh. All right. Um, Chuck Schumer. Let's talk a little bit about him. Soon to be Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer spoke to Fox News about President Trump. Let's watch. I do think it's possible under certain terms we could get a major infrastructure bill done, but uh, maybe even in the first hundred days. But that infrastructure bill has to have certain things for us to support it. It can't just be tax credits. There won't be enough. It has to be large and bold. Trump has talked about a trillion dollars good. And we're There's not going to... Federal spending. Federal spending, exactly. Not just tax expenditures. And it can't cut the basics like Medicare and education and other things to pay for it. But if he wants to do a major infrastructure bill focused on infrastructure and with those criteria, Area, it's very possible. Well, let's do a lightning round. Quick questions, quick answers sure. on a number of items in the Trump agenda. There's been talk about a possible deal infrastructure, which Democrats would like and some Republicans, but in return, tax reform, corporate tax way to get some of those trillions of dollars back to this country. Look, it's not something that I'd take off the table. And I did some negotiations with Paul Ryan about this. But to get the kind of infrastructure money that Donald Trump is talking about, then you'd, you'd have to do a lot more than international tax reform to get it done. 
just doesn't bring in the dollars you need. Uh, what about trade deals, killing some of the, renegotiating yes. some of the trade deals? These are good, these are very good questions. Thank you. On, surprisingly, on several different issues, Donald Trump and his campaign echoed the views of Democrats, not Republicans. Massive transportation bill, trade, getting rid of the carried interest loophole, cleaning up the swamp. And on those issues where he agrees with us and the Republican establishment and hard right doesn't, we challenge him. Work with us and keep your promises to blue collar America. I think blue collar America voted for Donald Trump more on Democratic issues than on Republican issues, which he professed. Yeah, it pains me to say this, but Chuck Schumer is right. Um, now, there's a lot of hypocrisy in what he's saying because he's the one that argued Hillary Clinton's strategy should be to snub those workers. I mean, uh, the quote was something like, for every blue-collar worker you lose as a voter, you gain two white-collar workers in the suburbs of Philadelphia. So in other words, yeah, the working man, pff, the downtrodden, fuck them. Let's go to the upper middle class people and we'll get our votes there. So let's get moderate Republicans as opposed to people who are, you know, working men and women, working families, even poor families. So there's a lot of hypocrisy because he, he specifically said snub those people. And now he's like, well, you know, I think uh, President Trump got elected as a result of appealing to those people. Well, that's true. He did, which is why you should have appealed to those people and you should have ran a candidate who could appeal to those people. Bernie Sanders. Anywho. Uh, so there's a lot of hypocrisy in what he's saying. You don't get me wrong, Chuck Schumer is a neoliberal disaster. He's part of the Iraq war, you know, he's, he was pro-torture. I mean, the list goes on and on of deregulation of Wall Street. I mean, this guy is kind of the quintessential neoliberal. So, and we did a story on him the other day. You can go check that out if you want to know more details. But in terms of that argument, did voters, most of the people who voted for Donald Trump, was it, oh, I love how bigoted he is? Or was it, oh, shit, he's ripping NAFTA, he's ripping TPP, he's saying he's going to look out for the working man, he wants to do an infrastructure bill, he says he's not going to cut our Social Security. I do think that was the main reason. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to overstate it in that direction either. Now, I think that's most of them voted for him because, again, he was economically pretty liberal with a lot of the shit that he said. But then there are people who, and Hillary Clinton got a lot of shit for saying this, but she was actually much more nuanced than people gave her credit for. This is a rare area where I don't think Hillary Clinton was wrong. But she said, um, there are the basket of deplorables that also vote for Donald Trump. Look, I don't know how anybody can deny that. There are some people who, it, the main reason why they vote for him is because he says, let's ban 1.6 billion Muslims from coming into the country. Let's deport 11 million undocumented immigrants. Let's do nationwide stop and frisk which, by the way, has been proven well over 90% of the time. I think over 95% of the time, it doesn't yield anything. And then of the, the what, however many percentage points it is that you do yield something, how many of them are just, hey, somebody has a little bit of weed? And it's obviously used disproportionately to target minority communities. So it's like taking away the Fourth Amendment rights of minorities all across the country. So here's a guy who also ran on law and order. We're going to stop. And by the way, law and order, but he wants to pull out of the Geneva Conventions and kill families overseas. Weird kind of law and order you got there, buddy. The kind that doesn't apply to you. But so bring back stop and frisk, deport all undocumented immigrants, you know, ban all Muslims. So here's a guy, I mean, he ran on fucking, not that he ran on it, but before he ran, he was the most prominent birther in the country. So, oh, Obama, you know, hinting, it just peddling nonsense to the idiots who think Obama's a Kenyan Muslim. So, yeah, there's also a strong element of bigotry in what he was saying. So some of the people voted for him, I'd say most of the people voted for him because he's economically populist, and they thought, he, I think he's going to look out for me, even though he's rough around the edges, and I don't think Hillary Clinton is. She's an elitist insider. But then there are some people who it's a mix. So, like, they like the xenophobia, but they're not outwardly xenophobic. But they're like, okay, I could live with that. And they like the economically populist message. But then there are some people who are just like, it's all about that. It's all about the, the hatred and the bigotry. Hillary said it's like 50-50. Maybe that's a little too harsh. You know, I don't know what percentage of his supporters are just deplorable, but there are some scary numbers coming out of his crowd. I think 59% think Obama's foreign-born. I mean, like, yeah, that is a deplorable belief. I mean, it's been proven otherwise, but you're still holding on to the opposite belief. I wonder why that is. Could it be because he's got dark skin? Mm, let me think about it. 
Um, so some of them, yeah, just are deplorable. I mean, you did have the KKK, you did have neo-Nazis, white nationalists, the alt-right. These people all lined up in unison behind them. And I think it was more because of the xenophobia than because of, hey, I might look out for workers, maybe. That's my rhetoric on the campaign trail. So it's a mix. But overall, I think Schumer's right that he wouldn't have won this election if most of the voters weren't voting for him because of the other stuff he was saying. I mean, it's, they probably thought, look, I, I could overlook the other shit that I don't necessarily agree with because I think he's going to look out for working people. So uh, interesting and rare that I'm agreeing with Chuck Schumer. <laughs> okay, now... Okay. There's a new poll out, and they asked Americans... If they wanted the facts in media coverage, interesting thing to put out there. Hey, would you like uh, information? Data? Uh, and basically, you know, it's, would you want the facts or would you, do you want interpretation? So what, what are you into? 59% uh, of Americans said, look, for, for the news, for politics coverage, just the facts. Thank you very much. 59%. Okay, that is, first of all, overwhelming. Um, and it shows that the American people are actually more adultish than the mainstream media gives them credit for. Now, why do I say that? Well, we know from a Harvard study, get this, this is from this election, quote, only 7% of the media's reporting on Bernie Sanders was about his issues. 28% of Clinton's coverage was issue focused. So, wow, man, really? I mean, that is 28% for Hillary, and that's the best. And Bernie with 7% of the coverage was issues focused. That needs to be like 80% plus. So the American people, they're yearning. They're in a fucking news and information desert. And then we all wonder, well, how is it that Donald Trump could win? How is it that we get any of the candidates that we end up with? I mean, as goofy and shitty as they all were. I mean, really? We had fucking Lincoln Chafee on the Democratic side. We have Jim Webb. We had uh, Marco Rubio and Jeb Bush. Ugh. I mean, apart from the corporate money propping these idiots up and that being the number one thing that, you know, leads to getting those kinds of candidates. The second thing is this vacuous, vapid media coverage where it's a bunch of people a bunch of idiots who don't know much about politics or policy talking about the horse race aspect of it, giving their opinion and not caring about or giving the facts. Again, only 7% of the coverage of Bernie Sanders was fact-based, which means policy-based. 59% of Americans say, look, just the facts. In other words, just the policies, please. Just the policies and the record, and I'm out. So look, man, not to pat, pat myself on the back, too hard not to pat new media on the back too hard, but that's why we're here. Now, obviously, I give my opinion too, but you know when I'm giving my opinion and you know when I'm giving the facts. So when I'm giving the meat of the news story, like those numbers I just gave you, those are facts. So I'm giving the facts. And people, they just want to hear that. If you give them that, well, then they'll be a little bit more open. Okay, then you can say whatever the fuck you want. Just give me the facts, though. I need the facts, 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 facts. So... That's the answer, man. And this is why new media is thriving right now. And this is why they're doing so well. And this is why old media is dying. I mean, young people love new media way more than fucking, what are you going to do? Sit there and watch CNN or HLN? Please, don't be ridiculous. So they love new media because they get something out of it. And that's the answer. The answer is we got to take over. New media has got to take over. We got to be the number one source. And I think eventually we'll get there. There's this kind of melding together happening of TV and internet. And when people have an option, even though we have way more competition online too, because it's just an ocean of content. On TV, there's only so many channels. But look, you give us a, a, a fair shot. You just get our foot in the door and we're going to take over. Okay, now... John Bolton. Donald Trump's potential uh, Secretary of State, John Bolton, had some words for Obama over the weekend about Israel. The Hill explains here, former United Nations Ambassador John Bolton warned Sunday that President Obama should not take any actions before leaving office that could hurt Israel at the UN. He said, 
There is a lot of speculation over in Turtle Bay at UN headquarters about resolutions that recognize a Palestinian state or that try and set a boundary for Israel based on the 1967 ceasefire lines. I think that'd be very inadvisable for the president to do that. During his final UN speech, Obama said that uh, Israel would be in a better position if it did not permanently occupy and settle Palestinian land. Damn. Okay, so I have a lot to say about this. First of all, um, I don't know if this fear on, fear on Bolton's part is founded because Obama just gave Israel, what was it, $38 billion in military aid? Pretty sure he's on Team Israel. <laughs> $38 billion is ridiculous. And they know what's that money going to go for? To continue occupation, to continue apartheid, and to expand further and take more Palestinian land. So the U.S. does this all the time. They go, tut, tut, you should not do that, Israel. Now let me look away as you do it. So I don't know if he's going to do it. I would be surprised if he does it. But man, that would be a bold move on the way out the door, man. I'd give Obama a hell of a lot of credit if he goes, you know what? We're lifting our veto at the UN. We believe in a Palestinian state. We now declare it. And then you'd have to negotiate the borders. If he says 67 borders, I'll love him too. I mean, that's, you know, because people now are at the point where they're like scoffing even at that idea. Like, oh, the 67, well, there's too many, uh, you know, Israelis that live past those borders. So what are you going to do? Get them off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they kind of, a lot of land is being occupied illegally under international law. This idea of like, whoa, look at this radical. What do you want to like enforce international law? Yeah, <laughs> you don't. You're the radical. So I, I don't know if he's going to do it, but he should do it. And I give him a lot of credit if he does do it, because it's time to end that monstrosity. I mean, how long? Is it going to be permanent occupation? And then the entire time, I always find it hilarious. It's not hilarious. It's really sad, actually. But as Israel takes more and more land from the Palestinians, as they crack down more and more, they turn around and they play the victim. Like, oh my God, I can't believe it. We're, we've had a few Palestinian attacks recently. You just took almost all their land. <laughs> What did you expect them to do? Fucking leave you some milk and some cookies? What's wrong with you? So I hope he does this bold move. And I also hope, by the way, I mean, I would go further. You guys know me. I'd say, yeah, day one, lift the veto. Palestinians say we're on board with that. Also, I'm not going to give you any military aid or any aid period until you get your shit together and stop occupying and go back to the 67 borders. And potentially, we'll be having a conversation about sanctions too. I mean, it, you want to get them to act, you got to do something. So, and I'd say, look, you can avoid all that simply by saying we accept the Palestinian state and accept the 67 borders and we'll iron out all the details. So it's time for a U.S. president to finally get tough because, look, that also, that does breed a lot of terrorism, man. It does. You know, that's a huge issue in the Muslim world. It's a slap in the face to the Muslim world, this land being taken. So we'll see what happens here, but I find it hilarious that John Bolton is like, He's like, don't do it. Why would you do it? Why would you be a decent human being and care about equal rights for everybody? Because normal people are decent people. <laughs> John Bolton's the guy who wants war everywhere. He's the, he still defends the Iraq war today. He's, oh, he thinks Obama's seven interventions. Pff, child's play. That's nothing, son. That's nothing. Uh, he, we just covered the story the other day. He wanted to attack Iran. He still wants to attack Iran. He was saying they, they need regime change. So this guy's never met a war he didn't like, which is why he's even more warlike, and he's like, oh, Palestinians? Yeah, fuck them. Don't do anything anti-Israeli, even if it's just saying, hey, abide by international law. So John Bolton, keeping it classy, as always. All right, we're getting there, y'all. I got um, two stories left here. Donald Trump took to Twitter to praise the new Senate minority leader, Chuck Schumer. Uh, but listen to what he said here. Quote, I have always had a good relationship with Chuck Schumer. He is far smarter than Harry Reid and has the ability to get things done. Good news. Okay, so uh, a random shot at Harry Reid there. And um, if you know Donald Trump, you should already know what's coming next. Here's what he said in the past about Harry Reid. Or here's, excuse me, what he did for Harry Reid in the past. President-elect Donald Trump wrote a letter of praise to Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid in 2010 after the, the Nevada Democrat won a tough re-election race. Trump gave $4,800 to Reid in his race against Sharon Angle and wrote him a short post-election note that simply said, Congratulations, you are amazing! 
And then it was signed, Best Wishes from Trump. <laughs> you are amazing. You're awesome. Best wishes. Mwah. I love you. Here's some money. This is Donald Trump 101, man. I mean, the only reason I'm covering this story is because this ranks so low on the Donald Trump, like, scandals that it uh, barely even registers. I've only saw literally one article about this in The Hill, and nobody else even talks about it because it's like, well, that's nothing for Trump. But, like, it should be something because he contradicts himself on everything. Now, Hillary Clinton did too, so he was able to get away with it and win, but I feel like he gets away with it more than anybody else. For fuck's sake, with Hillary Clinton, he said about her when she was Secretary of State, I think she's one of the best Secretaries of State ever. She's amazing. She's a tremendous lady, believe me. And then, like, 18 minutes later, he launched his uh, presidential campaign against her, and he's like, Sad. Worst person ever. Corrupt. Crooked Hillary. Terrible. I mean, how... Can you imagine? I mean, that level of hypocrisy... Again, if Obama had that level of hypocrisy... You know, there was a video of him just endlessly praising or donating to fucking Mitt Romney or some shit. And then fast forward when he's running against him, Mitt's terrible. Crooked Mitt. <laughs> Worst person ever. People be like, oh, but wait, you said the opposite before. So there would be, you know, it, it would be more of a story. But with Trump, it happens with so many people and on so many issues that everybody's like. <laughs> so yet again, this comes back to one of my main theories about Donald Trump, which is, and during the primary, you could see this more than, more than anywhere else. But contradictions don't matter to his followers. So in other words, what happens is they hear him say something they really agree with one day, something they really disagree with another day. But what they do is, since they like his aura and his persona and his personality and his arrogance and how bombastic he is, they just, what they'll do is they'll pick the thing that they like that he said, and they'll go, that's the thing he really believes. The other thing he was just saying to appease people and try to get more voters, and I can live with that. But that's the thing he really believes. No, you, you don't know that. You don't know that. You have no clue if that's what he really believes. He doesn't probably fucking know if that's what he really believes. But he's able to override it. So, I mean, Trump has you know, proven, if nothing else, it, that, like, alpha male, ape-like arrogance and certitude it can just do people over. It, like, fucking mystifies people. Like, yeah, I don't know. He seems like he's got it under control. But he said the opposite thing yesterday. I don't care. I think he believes the thing that I want him to believe. So, and look, this is a test moving forward. I will be very curious to see. Will the Republicans do exactly what they did under Bush and Reagan, which is, even when they acted in a way that was not conservative, you had the Republicans defend them. Uh, what do you mean? It's great because Bush did it. It's great because Reagan did it because they're Republicans, and I agree with them no matter what they do. That's basically what happened. Are they going to do that with Trump? Like, let's say Trump actually starts to do, you know, some fairly liberal things. I would love it, by the way, if he did some fairly liberal things. But let's just say, for argument's sake, he does. Like a massive infrastructure bill. The Republicans just spent the last eight years opposing an Obama infrastructure bill. They're against infrastructure by default. Like, yeah, no, we're just against it. We don't want to have big government spend money in the economy. No, we want private business. No big government. So they just spent eight years opposing it. If Trump proposes it, are they going to go, oh, yeah, no, we love infrastructure now. I tend to think they will say that, even though they used to argue on principle we're against this infrastructure spending. So the hypocrisy is all too real, and it's disgusting, and... God, it just makes me want to call it out 24-7 because this should matter to people. Your principles should matter to you, but it looks like they just abandon them when they latch onto a personality they like. Okay, final story of the day, y'all, for the new studio. New studio. That's what we are in. It's a new studio. Do you like my song? It is very mediocre. That wasn't a good ending. Okay. Fucking love this place, man. I'll tell you that right now. I'm gonna tell you that. Believe me, tremendous. The New York Times uh, has a sad story about the police state that Turkey has slowly but surely become. Listen to this. A prominent columnist wrote recently about how President Recep Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey hates cigarettes so much that he confiscates packs from his followers, lecturing them on the evils of smoking. The columnist uh, Kadri Gersel, Gersel forgive me for mispronouncing that, as I'm sure I did, then urged his readers to protest the president's anti-democratic ways by lighting a cigarette and not putting it out. For that, Mr. Gersel was arrested on terrorism charges and is being held in pretrial detention, one of 120 journalists who have been jailed in Turkey's crackdown on the, new, on the news media since a failed coup attempt in July. Um, wow. So this guy's like, look, 
Erdogan's a douche. He doesn't like cigarettes. He confiscates them from his uh, from people around him. Uh, how about freedom, bitch? I want everybody to light one up in protest. So they're like, we gotta arrest this guy on terrorism charges for what he just said and did. What? <laughs> terrorism. That's what this is. This is terrorism. What? No, this is what happens when you have a thin-skinned, impulsive buffoon who's an authoritarian running a country. By the way, thank God we didn't just elect a thin-skinned authoritarian buffoon. <sighs> How sad is this? Somebody, so somebody smoking in a free country and advocating, you know what, hey, for freedom's sake, to protest our shitty president, smoke. We must arrest him. We must arrest him. No, you mustn't, but they did. Now, listen to this fact, because it gets worse. 3,000 people have been arrested for insulting the president in Turkey. Civil liberties, human rights, common sense, forget it, forget it. What I, oh, what I find amazing about these kinds of people is, I have no doubt his ego is so big, he wants to go in the history books, you know, he wants his name to be affiliated. I mean, I'm, I bet he would want Turkey to be called Erdoganistan. <laughs> so, I, I mean, this guy, he wants to be... A historical figure that his people look up to and oh my god we love him so much but he he in the pursuit of that goal he does the opposite he does shit that'll make people fucking despise him and hate him and rightfully so rightfully so so I never like what is it about that massive ego narcissistic authoritarian personality that needs the love and the adoration but they go about it in all the wrong ways why are you doing that you're making people fucking hate you not love you that is literally the dumbest thing you could do. And the number one thing you could do to make people go, Hey, fuck you, prick. Really? That's what you're gonna do? Lock somebody up for smoking a cigarette. 3,000 people for insulting the president. That shouldn't be a thing. I mean, that's basically people getting arrested in Turkey for me doing my show that I'm doing for you right now. If I was doing this show in Turkey and I was criticizing the president, Day one, son, they break down the door and drag me out in handcuffs. And this is a top U.S. ally. This is shameful. And then the U.S. goes around and presents, oh, no, we care about human rights. That's what, that's, that's what it's all about, man. We care. We're the world police. It's all about altruism, which is why we back Saudi Arabia, who beheads people for witchcraft and sorcery, and they say women are second-class citizens, and they say all atheists are terrorists. And we back Erdogan, who arrests people for insulting him and is uh, making people in Turkey live under a police state. But outside of that, man, we care about human rights. No, you don't. Stop lying to yourself. Stop lying to the world. And you should actually apply pressure to him to get him to stop doing this. Not war. I'm not talking about war. I'm talking about economic pressure. I'm talking about sit down and have a conversation with him. Let him know, look, son, <coughs> it doesn't fly. So I doubt that they'll do that. But you need to know what's happening in Turkey and you need to know what's happening with this authoritarian crackdown. And ever since the failed coup attempt, it's been a disaster, purging thousands of people, locking people up. They're freeing, I just saw the story the other day, they're freeing actual criminals to make room for political prisoners. Beyond sad, horrendous, and I feel horrible for these people. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. The first show in the new studio. I'm ecstatic. I hope you love the new studio. Can't wait to do more shows out of here. Anyway. Mwah. Goodbye from the new Secular Talk Studios. The left. The left. Lefty. Please don't make me slap you with the left. The left. You